Good evening, everyone. How nice to see everybody. Uh, if you're not familiar with Legatum Institute, it is an international think tank and an educational charity. And I'm Sian Hansen. I'm the chief executive here. And um, you're very, very welcome. We do a number of different programs of research and work here. But what we're all focused on is prosperity. We care deeply about the levers and the drivers of prosperity. And you can see a lot of our literature out in the, in the foyer. Now, we also have a number of events, but I'm particularly excited about the, the, this event because on the 23rd of June, if you haven't noticed, the country is going to the ballot box uh, to make a decision that I think arguably will shape the future of Britain's place in the world. Now, according to the opinion polls, the public is split down the middle on this issue, um, whether we should remain or leave. And for many people, the referendum in six weeks' time is going to be the first chance they have to vote on our membership of the EU. And the polls are showing that younger people are overwhelmingly in the Remain camp. And the older demographic, especially the over 60s, who, by the way, also voted in the 1975 referendum, are much more skeptical. So there are 7 million undecided voters, which um, both sides are going to be going after over the next couple of weeks. And it's said to be quite a momentous occasion for Britain. And we at Legatum felt that we would be truly missing out if we didn't host a panel debate on the subject. Now, it's Britain's place in, in Britain's future in Europe that we're concentrating on today. Now, we have a balanced panel here. We don't take a view uh, one way or the other, but we hope that this will be very informative. Now, before I step down and hand over, I'd just like to say thank you to Maribou, who's our sponsor for tonight. We're incredibly grateful. They're a financial services company that operate all over the world. And there's many representatives here of Maribou, so if you'd like to learn more about them, do, do reach out to them. In the meantime, I'm going to hand over to our brilliant Director of Economics of Prosperity, Shankar Singham. Thank you. Thank you, Sion. Well, we, we have a, uh, a stellar panel for you to, to discuss this question. And this is not your typical Brexit panel that, that I'm sure you've all probably tired of by now. Um, we're, 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 going to talk, uh, in, we're going to put this in a bit of context. And we're going to talk about Britain's future in the world, as, as Sion um, mentioned. Um, we're going to discuss what we think Britain's role in the world is, what the panel thinks Britain's role in the world is, before we get into the subject of the relationship between um, uh, Britain and the, Euro the European Union and the single European uh, market. Um, so uh, I will, none of these panelists need any introduction, but I'm going to introduce them anyway so that you know who they are. Um, on the far right there, not not in political terms, um, <laughs> perhaps, um, is, this was not intentionally done this way, but um, Steve Baker is the MP for Wickham. His career began in the Royal Air Force as an engineer officer. He became a chartered engineer through the Royal Aer Aeronautical Society, um, read an MSc in computer science at Oxford. Um, he founded, co-founded with Toby Baxendale, who is very close to us at the Legatum Institute, um, the uh, Cobden Centre. Um, which, which is very much uh, following the Richard Cobden philosophy of free trade and peace. Uh, twice been elected to the executive of the Conservative 1922 Committee, and he's a member of the Treasury Select Committee. And he is a prominent um, Brexiteer, a prominent uh, Vote Leave uh, campaigner. Uh, Gideon Rackman is the Chief Foreign Affairs Columnist for the Financial Times. Uh, he has been multiple awards, um, Commentator of the Year in the European Press uh, Awards in, in 2016. Uh, he wrote a, a fantastic book, actually, uh, in 2011, uh, Zero Sum World. Um, uh, he's a regular contributor to the FT, to The Economist, and numerous other publications. And then on my immediate right, Anne Applebaum is the director of the Legatum Institute's Transitions Forum. She is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, has written uh, numerous books, particularly focused on the former Soviet Union and uh, Central and Eastern Europe. And I think you're writing a book right now on, on uh, Ukraine. Uh, and both Gideon and, well, I'm not sure about Gideon publicly, but Anne certainly um, has been 
prominent in the Remain, on the Remain side um, of, of this debate. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a conversation. So this is not a debate. We're going to have a conversation with our panelists. Um, we're going to talk about Britain's role in the world first. Then we're going to talk about the single market. Um, and we're going to ask, we're going to break this down into three, three large topics. You know, one is sovereignty and, and Britain's so sovereignty. Uh, we're going to talk about economics and economic policy. And then we're going to talk finally about foreign policy. Um, and so we have a, a, a spread of panelists, not only in their views about, about Brexit, um, but also in their expertise in foreign policy, economic policy, and a range of the subjects that we want to, uh, to, to discuss. So the first question, I, I, this may be the only time I actually ask you all the same question, um, but I would like you all to give f fairly briefly um, your vision for what you think Britain's role <coughs> in the world actually is. Um, both in terms of a foreign policy dimension, perhaps in terms of the economic policy dimension, um, so that we can then launch into the discussion about how we relate to, uh, to Europe. So why don't we start with Anne, and then we'll just go down the line. So um, thank you very much, um, Shanker, and I will tell one joke. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I once heard a funny story about Henry Kissinger, which actually turned out to be a true story. Uh, he was once on a panel or at a, at a dinner much like this one, and somebody said, um, now, now it's time for Dr. Kissinger. Um, he needs no introduction. And Dr. Kissinger stood up and said, I may not need no introduction, but I so enjoy them. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so I'm in a unique position. I'm American, but I have a British passport, um, which means I swore an oath of loyalty to the Queen, um, which is something that most British people don't actually ever have to do. Mm. Um, and I'm therefore really a booster. Um, I'm very pro-British, and I would like Britain's role in the world to be as large and expansive and as influential as possible. Um, and that is why I um, want Britain to stay in Europe. Um, I, I'm also maybe unusual in that I live part of the time in London, and I also live part of the time in Eastern Europe. And so I have a kind of dual perspective on how Europe works. I see it, um, I see it from different sides. Um, I see its, its impact in the poorer part of Europe and Eastern Europe, and I also see how it works um, in other places. Um, and I can say that Britain's, Britain's role in Europe has been um, really extraordinarily positive. Um, Britain has been a voice for free markets, um, for free trade. Um, it's been a voice for the integration of Eastern Europe. Um, one of the reasons why the integration of Eastern Europe was as successful as it was was because Britain was one of the countries pushing very hard to make it happen. Um, and, it, and it's one of the reasons why it was successful. Um, Britain, you know, within the EU group has been, uh, has pushed for, has pushed for a more active, uh, when, it, when it has done, recently it hasn't, but in the past when it's, when it's pushed, for, uh, you know, the EU to do foreign policy, it's been an incredibly influential and positive. It's listened to in Europe on foreign policy in the way almost no other country has. So, for example, a couple of years ago um, when the EU was putting together sanctions on Russia, you know, Britain played an incredibly important role in pulling together um, you know, the different countries from Europe and within an EU institution, within the EU foreign policy group and, and the European Council, um, Britain was one of the countries that made it happen. Um, you know, I see, you know, for, for, you know, for me, you know, I see the EU for Britain as a kind of expander. You know, you can, ex you can use it to spread and expand British influence. And of course, without Britain, the EU will be more protectionist. Um, it will be more closed. Um, it will be more provincial. Um, it will be more inward looking. Um, and my, my desire for Britain to be in the EU is partly, you know, with, you know, with my both American hat and my East European hat on, it's my desire for the EU to be, um, in, to play a large role in the world and for British values to be reflected through it. And so, I, you know, I really do see Britain's role in the world. Britain is not, um, you know, it's not, a, it's not a global superpower. It doesn't have, um, the military strength of the United <coughs> States, you know, it doesn't have, um, you know, it doesn't have the kind of growth that China has, but um, it stands for a very concrete um, set of values which it has successfully promoted um, via the EU and via NATO and via its relationship with the United States, you know, over the last several decades, and I, I would hate for it um, to lose that. Mm -hmm. Gideon, what's his role in the world? Yeah, well, I mean, it depends 
what you mean by role in the world, because in mm. some ways, I mean, we're sitting in one of the great international cities, so mm. in that sense, Britain, through London, is at the hub of a lot of uh, finance, mm. business, um, communications. I do think, however, that, you know, that, that in recent years, Britain's role as a foreign policy actor has diminished sharply. And I think that that will probably continue in to a mixture of kind of resources and national mood. And uh, that will probably, I think, continue whether or not we stay in the EU. I'll explain in a minute mm. how I think the whole EU thing fits into that. But mm. just to give you a couple of examples of what I mean. So last week I was at a seminar convened in the Foreign Office, mainly Americans and Europeans talking about what was going to happen in Syria and mm. whether there would be any uh, chance of peace there. And it was really a discussion about American foreign policy, Russian foreign policy, the Turks, the Saudis, and Britain was, you know, we're giving a bit of aid. But the, the idea, in, in the past, I think the Brits would have assumed that they would kind of be at the center of a discussion like that. And even though it was at the Foreign Office, we were essentially bystanders. Uh, hmm. That reminded me of um, last year being actually in Milan, where the, there was a discussion on Ukraine. And in a hotel room in, in Milan, there was, Putin and Merkel and Hollande uh, and their people, but no David Cameron. He wasn't part of that discussion. Uh, the rise of China is obviously the big issue for the coming century. Tensions are rising between the US and China and the Pacific. But Britain essentially has a very commercial approach to China. It's not interested in playing a role in the geopolitics of that. Uh, so although we have a lot of legacy power through membership of the UN Security Council, through the military and so on, I think perhaps as a legacy of the Iraq war, which uh, and Afghanistan, and then of Libya going so badly wrong. The British have lost their interest in military intervention, and they've also seem to have lost confidence in their ability to, we talk a lot about how professional our diplomatic service is, but in their ability to be a convener of ideas. And I think that, how does that relate to membership of the EU? Well, as Anne said, you know, potentially the EU, if it were to work well, which is a big if, is a, is a magnifier of British influence. If you could form a common European position. Um, and in some ways, although that sounds uh, bizarre at times, actually, these are countries that we have more in common with than almost any other countries in the world. I mean, if we can't get on with the French and the Germans, why would we think we'd have more in common with the Chinese or the Russians? Um, and yet, the EU foreign policy has not worked terribly well. And Britain hasn't wanted to make it work well because we don't believe in it. We, we, we have a sort of ideological objection to it. So we're not going to try and use that anyway. The special relationship, sure, I mean, it, it exists, even uh, for Obama's you know, uh, words about trade and so on. But as a matter of fact, when America looks at its interests around the world, it looks, as all countries do, is how useful can these guys be to me? There are times when we're useful to them at the, the UN or uh, you know, if you're forming an international coalition on this or that. But essentially, American foreign policy is now about China, it's about the Middle East, it's about Russia. And as I said, we're bit part players in all of that. And I don't think. Uh, if we leave the EU, our influence is going to increase. I would think, on the contrary, it would, it would diminish. Because uh, while, I mean, Steve will, will, I'm sure, make a case for why it makes sense to him. But, uh, and, and maybe he's thought harder about it than Obama and Abe and Xi Jinping. But most foreign leaders who think about, no, I mean, that's true. We, we, sit, we think a lot about it. They, you know, it's kind of one issue on their desk. But if their instinctive reaction to all these guys from very different starting points is that this sounds crazy. Why would you do that? Um, and they don't think, oh, good, you know, Britain's now going to be out there as this kind of new dynamic actor changing the world. I don't think that tends to be their attitude. So, Steve, uh, Britain is a diminished power um, in the world. It needs the European Union in order to magnify, as Gideon said, its, its influence. What's your reaction? Well, it's, that's a pretty bleak assessment, isn't it? But I was, I'm really fascinated to be on this panel, and thank you for the opportunity. This is a great and dangerous opportunity for me to get <laughs> off the territory of the vote leave line to take at a critical moment in the campaign. So thank you very much for having me along here. You each said a few things that I really agreed with. So, Anne, you said that uh, you wanted the UK to be expansive and influential, and of course I agree. And um, Gideon, you said uh, that one of the problems is that we don't believe in the project. And of course, I agree. And you were very generous just then in saying that maybe we think more about these things than some of the great global leaders, and because it is just one issue um, on, the, on their desk. And you also said, if it were to work well, which is a big if. And that's a really important problem. I happened to look up the, um, the migration figures from Eurostat before I came over. And um, if you look at youth unemployment in the southern parts of the EU, 30% youth unemployment in Portugal, 38.8 in Italy, Spain 45.9, Greece 
51.9% youth unemployment. And the truth is it isn't working well. And these levels of unemployment are despite the ECB stepping up QE to 80 billion euros a month. You wonder what would happen if they put those 80 billion euros in paper money, put them into lorries and started shipping around. What effect that would have on, it, it, on the confidence people have in paper money. But I get ahead of myself. Britain's role in the world is to go global. And that's why Business for Britain with Change or Go is based around, let's hold it the right way up, this poster, I'll put it there for the camera, this poster, let's go global. The point is really is this, that since the European Union was designed as a peace scheme following the Second World War, the world has changed immeasurably. So for one, another example, a company called Ghost produces blogging software. They've announced they're, they're moving to Singapore, but this is what they say about themselves. We're a distributed company, we have no business premises, and our staff are all over the world. We're an online company. Thanks to the power of the internet, our customers are all over the world. Why are they going outside the EU? Because of the EU's VATMOS directive and also our accounting standards. They're just not willing to do business in the European Union. But what are they actually going to do? Basically, they'll put a brass plate in Singapore and continue to do global business. And this is one of the most profound and important factors in the world as it is today. The internet and inexpensive air travel has profoundly changed the way that entrepreneurs and civilians, uh, civilians who tell my military background, <laughs> <laughs> entrepreneurs and ordinary citizens live their lives. I mean, I've done business in Japan and I've done business in the USA and it really wasn't very hard and they were services, service businesses and we just got on with it and it was fine. It wasn't difficult and we didn't need a trade agreement. We needed to get on an aeroplane and raise the invoices afterwards. So my point is this, the choice we have today is either to stick with an outdated solution to the old problems of economic nationalism of the, the, the war era, or to say actually we have had enough of trying to make this thing work which isn't working well, which has resisted the <coughs> Prime Minister's attempts to fundamentally reform it, and actually we are going to, by our, by our own exertions, save our own country, and by our exa example, save the world, Europe and the world, by reforming global international institutions so that they work for everybody. In my view, what the European Union and the world is going through is a foreseeable crisis in political economy, which comes from trying to use a shared court uh, and a shared political institutions within an in a set of interventionist nations within a customs union. That is the argument of this wonderful book, written in 1944. I'm not going to read out a couple of paragraphs I've flagged right now. I will later. But let's put it this way. <laughs> okay. Let's put it this way. What we're going through was foreseen, in general terms at least, very, very clearly in 1944. If you combine interventionist nation states in a customs union, <coughs> you end up with really centralised political governance, a lack of democratic accountability, and you end up with a, a, a people starting to ask that question, are we willing to tolerate government which we cannot control at the ballot box? So I'll leave it there. Excellent. Um, so you mentioned interventionist states uh, in that last um, discussion. Um, so one of the big problems that, that I think many people on the Leave side have po pointed to is the regulatory burden in Europe and the interventionism, the dirigism of, of, of particularly some uh, European member states that has translated itself into Brussels regulation. Um, Gideon, do you think that um, structural reform, so some of the regulations that Steve referred to, the, the, a more pro-competitive approach, a more, a more, a more UK-style approach to the economic, uh, to economics and, and free markets and so forth, do you think that's achievable? I mean, Cameron went to Brussels to get these um, these special um, well, you know, I don't recognise this description of Britain as drowning in red tape produced from Brussels. Uh, as you point out, we, there, Britain has an approach. There, there, is, there are regulations coming out of Brussels which we might not want, but I don't see it as sort of choking off the economy. And um, you know, to the extent that France, for example, is in deep trouble, mm. this is to do with labour law reforms that the French could make if they could find the will. It's not Brussels that's imposed on them. In fact, Brussels is desperate for them to get on with actually reforming their labour market. So this, I, I think it's a kind of exaggeration. Also, 
to only see the, the disastrous bits of the European economy, and clearly the Eurozone is not working well, but Germany is a highly successful economy, has succeeded, is much more successful than we are, incidentally, in exporting to China. So the idea that there's some sort of trade-off and that because we're in Europe, we cannot exploit these markets in China or India or elsewhere, it's, it's, it's a false choice. Germany is, is a massive exporter to China because it happens to make things that, uh, that they want to sell there. And the other thing, I think, is that although you know, the European courts can be irritating and European regulation can be irritating. I, I, I think it's very easy to romanticize emerging markets. In fact, they're much more lawless than, mm. than Europe is. I mean, if you look at the kind of problems Vodafone I mean, have had in India, the massive back taxes that mm. were imposed on them, GlaxoSmithKline in China, these are, these are societies where, which would make you beg to have the European Court of Justice, which actually has a kind of legal framework. Uh, which is much more dependable than the emerging markets that you seem to romanticize as this little marvelous place where we'll, we'll have uh, the, the run of the place. I don't think the experience of British companies in these places have always been positive. Well, let me, let me come back to Steve and then I'm going to come to Anne on, on some sovereignty issues. But um, this issue of, of structural reform and, you know, can you, can you get this kind of reform? Um, is it necessary? Is it actually just as, as Gideon said, the member states themselves could easily do it? within within the, the confines of Brussels. Um, are there not good things, Steve, in, um, in the European Union in terms of regulatory, the European state aids rules that prevent countries from intervening in their, in their markets? In the US, states tax discriminatorily to bring investment in. That's illegal in Europe. Isn't that a good thing? So some of the good things about the European Union are very good things until they run into obstacles which, where, where, the, where the sort of great idealistic dream runs into the rocks of reality. So, for example, the free movement of people is a wonderful part of the old classical liberal dream. And if you're European, if you're a European Union citizen, it's a wonderful thing. But thousands of people in my constituency have family outside the European Union and they occasionally regard the EU's migration policy as discriminatory at best and racist at worst. Because if you are a second or third generation British Kashmiri in Wickham and you try and bring your family across to see the newborn, you can face, well, you certainly face categorically different migration barriers. And it starts to feel like, like, like that, that kind of discrimination is deeply unhealthy. Now, it's a natural so consequence. Steve, we're not going to have a more liberal immigration policy for Kashmiris if you keep it. Yeah, what? <laughs> well, you keep it. So I'm not. Or if we leave the EU. Um, so I'm not <laughs> proposing that UKIP should be in power nor to let them. But what I'm saying is that what we need is a fair and just migration policy based on British citizenship, which would be a migration policy which will enjoy, enjoy consent in a way that the Europe, mm. a policy based on European Union citizen, cl citizenship clearly doesn't. I mean, one of the other points, you mentioned the, the, having a Supreme Court. Of course, having a Supreme Court and having a single regulatory environment is a very good thing. These are defining features of a single nation state, and of course they get rid of trade barriers. Well, that's great, except when you find that the public does not consent <coughs> to that Supreme Court, and you run into a point where some, someone objects to a particular set of rules. Most of us, most of the time, don't care where rules come from. We care when we run into them and find that they don't suit us and we can't change them. So the clinical trials directive, Nobel laureates are saying it's killing people and we can't change it. The REACH chemicals directions, directive very nearly uh, destroyed a company in my constituency which deals with uh, Legionella, uh, 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 treating water to destroy Legionella. Uh, they were nearly put out of business. Um, why? Because big companies appear to have captured the regulatory state in the European Union. There's nothing I can do to prevent it. Um, live transport of animals. Huge democratic pressure on MPs to do something about it. It's an EU competence. We can't touch it. So some of these big, noble, idealistic dreams are wonderful until you, they either run into the, the, re, the rocks of reality of the way the world actually is, or until you find that they don't actually meet the democratic <coughs> consent. And that is really the fundamental issue of this referendum. Do you think that political power should be under democratic restraint? Now, I do. Why? Because people are imperfect and imperfectible, which both raises the need for government and the need to get rid of those who govern peacefully at the ballot box. Now, when you look at the way the EU functions, and David Cameron just found this, with so many member states and so many different electoral cycles, the difficulty of actually getting agreement on any particular issue at any particular part of the electoral cycle is going to be very large. When we vote in a European election, we do not, we cannot change the overall trajectory of policy. So to finish, 
One of my opponents in the Conservative Party, lovely chap, got on really well, but he made the point that great news, the Juncker Commission is far more liberal than the old Delors Commission to which we previously <coughs> objected. Well, that's great news, but it's a matter of chance. It's not as a result of the British public voting anywhere to say they would rather have a liberalising commission. Well, this is one of the big questions. We should be saying, honestly, do you want this set of institutions or do you want to have political institutions which are clearly subjected to democratic control and which exist in a globalised world which reflects the te technological changes which have taken place indisputably since the EU was designed in a different age. So you talk about consent, and, and this gets us into the, the subject I wanted to get Anne's uh, reaction to, which is sovereignty. So a huge part of this debate is about Britain's sovereignty. So what, what does sovereignty mean in 2016 with the multiplicity of organisations and other bodies that we're all subject to? Well, it's very interesting. I think that this, the, the, the origins in some way, the kind of emotional origins of the EU debate in Britain, in a, in, which are quite similar in some ways to the, or the, the very uh, powerful debate about trade that's now going on to the, in the United States, the origins are there is a, a sense that people have now that they aren't as in control of um, decisions that are made in their own countries as they used to be. You know, the factory next door um, is closing because somebody in China decided, made a decision and it's closing. Or um, the company is cutting, law, you know, cutting workers because someone in Berlin made that decision. And that's true. That's the effect of the global economy. In fact, it's the effect of the global economy that you, that Steve was praising a few minutes ago. You know, the fact is that countries are are connected and um, decisions made in one place have an impact on another. Um, and so the question is, in that kind of world, um, how do you return control to, um, to people? And the, you know, unfortunately, the answer is that you can't mm -hmm. in the way that you could have it in the 19th century you know, or even the, even the first half of the 20th century. You don't have, you, you know, in exchange for becoming wealthier, in exchange for the benefits of, fray, of trade, we lose some control and we've agreed in practice to do that a long time ago. So then the question is, okay, so you can have full control, but what do you want to be able to do? You want to be the country that can influence the way that decisions are made and the way that um, the, the structure, the legal structure within which the global economy operates. Um, and the only way you can do that is in conjunction with other countries. So you can't, as Britain by yourself, or you know, as Liechtenstein by itself, or you are not able to make decisions that um, that affect other countries, and you can't get other countries to agree with what you do. You know, Britain by itself can't say, right, I want Germany to. Um, we don't like this regulation in Germany; it's too burdensome for our companies. We want Germany to cut it. it. Just doesn't work that way. You know, the only way you can get Germany to loosen its regulations is by working with Germany inside an institution. And so the question, you know, the sovereignty question is a kind of complete red herring. You know, this, this, the question isn't sovereignty. The question is about influence. You know, what, you know, what can you, how do you, can you shape other countries? How can you shape the world according to your vision of it? And actually, Britain inside Europe has been unbelievably good at shaping the world. So the single market is to a very large extent a British idea. And the British have pushed hard for it. And the, 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 the competition policy that, um, that the EU uh, uses, which, which is, by the way, very much resented in, in France and Italy as some kind of Anglo-Saxon plot um, to keep markets open, um, has been a huge success for British ideas about markets. But, you know, but the point is you can only you have a competition policy, meaning an um, you know, anti-monopoly policy. You can only have that in an international sphere if you're part of an institution which has a set of rules and you know, in which there's some give and take and you win some arguments and you lose some. Um, and the other, the other fact that is very rarely stated in Britain and badly understood is how often Britain wins these arguments. I mean, there's some, there's a kind of bogus statistic that flows around. We lost, you know, these arguments in, in the European Council 57 times. Well, you've won it. I, I, I thought I had the number it's with thousand, me, I don't know, yeah. but it's like 2,999 times in, in, since 1999, and if you lost it a tiny number of times, Britain wins, the, the statistic I did find, Britain wins, is on the winning side 87% of the time. That's a good record. You know, Britain is good at convincing Europeans what to do and has been good at structuring the market for its own benefit and for the benefit of British companies. Yeah, can I just yeah. quick, quickly, I mean, it relates yeah. to what both Steve and Anne were saying on this question of sovereignty and regulation and so on. It struck me that Steve's uh, complaints could be answered if we were willing to embrace a kind of autarkic economy and just trade with ourselves. 
So uh, we could completely you know, ignore the REACH chemical directives if we were only selling chemicals within the UK. But when you wanted, if you were then wanted to sell them into Europe, you would have to obey the European <laughs> directives anyway. And as Anne points out, you wouldn't be around the table shaping them either. So your interests would, would not be taken into account when those regulations were made. I mean, even the United States has to obey European regulations when it wants to sell into Europe. So I remember when I was based in Brussels, there was a lot of kind of European muscle flexing because they were very pleased with themselves because they were able to block a merger between two American companies, mm. GE and Honeywell, mm -hmm. who couldn't merge because the European competition authorities objected to what they regarded as a monopolistic arrangement. And because the European market was very important to GE and Honeywell, they had to abandon the merger. Now, if that can happen, to, if they can push around to American companies, do you think that the British will simply be able to say, oh, well, we don't like these European regulations. We're going to just write all our own regulations because they're better because they're made by our own MPs. Mm -hmm. And well, fine, if you don't want to trade with Europe, but if you want to trade with Europe, you're going to live with those regulations anyway. Yeah, and also, you know, a lot of the complaints about, you know, as you were saying before, that the, um, you know, the problem with the French economy is France. The problem with the French economy is the EU. You know, if we, um, you know, if we would like to see a Europe which is less regulated and easier to trade with, you know, the only way we can get that is by acting through the EU. Mm. But Steve, you're not suggesting Britain go its own way completely. You're, you're suggesting that Britain has a future in the rest of the world yeah. with other countries outside the Euro European Union. Yeah, it's very interesting. Who don't have the REACH regulations, who don't have all the yeah, other... But they've got other regulations. regulations. But they have, they have yeah. regulations too. Right, but, but, it so is, it is, it, but it is clear that European regulation in some areas is, 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 is it? certainly more extensive than... Well, the US will not negotiate a regulatory agreement with, with, with Europe in the context of TTIP for this reason. But Steve, you... You don't think that your Britain's going off on its own Absolutely by itself? Absolutely not. So the reason I co-founded the Cobden Centre after Richard Cobden and Manchester Liberalism with Toby Baxendale is because I'm a, an internationalist. I want to see global free trade, single market with the world insofar as that is possible. But the, the, the real crux of the issue is this problem that we have a, a centre ground of political economy which believes in interventionism and that has consequences. And if you wish to be interventionist within a customs union, you will get centralised political institutions because otherwise the differentiation, uh, the, the differential costs of production around that customs union will result in capital and labour migrating to where it can be most productive and the other members of the customs union won't bear it. So you have to have centralised government. And if you want the full argument, I'm happy to point you to the, the author. <laughs> Who is this book? Who is this? <laughs> well, I'm happy to tell you about this because... <laughs> I love it. I love books. Mm. So oh, I I, I'm a, <laughs> so look. I'm only a humble aerospace and software engineer, right? I got into politics because although I was in favour of the European Union because of its liberal inclinations, with the European Union Constitution being a positive rejection of democracy, the way it was, the way the, the way instead of it being rejected at the ballot box. It was re replaced with the Lisbon Treaty precisely in order to get it through, get it passed democracies who otherwise would have rejected it. I thought, oh, something's wrong here. Something's wrong if actually we're rejecting democracy in order to further this project. And so, of course, I started to read because of being a good engineer. I like to have a head full of worthwhile ideas before I start doing practical things. And what I discovered is that for 100 years, there's been a, a massive change in political ideas. And I've brought some charts and graphs with me you can have a look at afterwards. But the point is, but prior to the First World War, of course, it was a classical liberal age. We then had two wars of transformation and a rich literature, Karl Popper's The Open Society and Its Enemies, uh, American Marxist, Burnham, The Managerial Revolution, of course, famously Hayek's Road to Serfdom, and, and this book. The, the author of this book, Ludwig von Mises, converted Hayek from socialism, which he, con which, which he um, confesses in the foreword to Ludwig von Mises' uh, book of the same name, Socialism. The, we're in a real problem of political, a real crisis of political economy. I go back to that point. Unemployment is cripplingly high in those southern European states, despite QE on an unprecedented scale. Extraordinary, if not emergency, monetary policy was how the governor It is dropping it. rapidly, so be careful, because this argument might not work six months from now. Well, the EU is now growing faster but, than Britain. But, yeah. That, yeah, well, that's a very... I don't think you... I don't think you... The uncertainty you, around this I, I'm trying to wrap this up and get back to you, because <laughs> I don't think you've defeated <laughs> me in the way you think you have, because I'd encourage anybody to go and read Hayek's Nobel Prize lecture, because one of the points he makes is that when patterns of employment are based upon increasing the money supply, those patterns of employment can last only so long as you know, the, money su the money supply continues. <laughs> the, the money supply continues to increase, or perhaps so long as it continues to accelerate. 
And what is happening in Europe at the moment is the increase in the money supply is being accelerated and unemployment's in, in, increasing. So for me, being a very practical person who tries to have good quality ideas and then look at what's going on, I think we're in a really profound crisis that has potentially devastating consequences. Because if people believe that this is a free market which is failing, then they will vote for more interventionism, more statism, something different. What do you see happening around the world? Trump, Corbyn, Podemos, Syriza, we could go on. There's a real problem, and I'm really grateful that Legatum seeks to not only revitalise capitalism, but also democracy. Because we need to recapture this idea of legitimate political power only being bent to those ends which genuinely further human prosperity. And that means limited government, globalism, low trade barriers, cooperation and friendship with the whole world and not just within a little club which seeks to band together in order to pursue economic nationalism at the continental scale. If, if and only Britain could and, have and, as good relations with the rest, economic relations with the rest as Germany. So that's what we, that's what we should aspire to. Well, let, let's, let's talk about um, uh, one uh, speech that Theresa May made recently about um, when she came out in favour of Remain. And, um, Can I just say, look, the answers to the problem of the world are never in a single book or even two books. Of course not. You know, you remind me of uh, students I used to know who'd read out the Communist Manifesto. It's all there on page 44. I mean, you think you're a practical guy, <laughs> but actually you're enthralled to a bunch of ideas that you've kind of half digested. You know, look at the real world. Although, Gideon, to be fair to Steve, I think that what he just said in terms of limited government, uh, the classical liberal position, is not something that any of you would disagree with um, in terms of uh, open trade, property rights protection. Yeah, but what does that mean in practice now? You know, you want, okay, open trade, you want to trade more. So no, no, you, know, you, want to, you, you want, want to trade, trade more. more with Europe. What do you do? Well, if you leave the EU, you will have less trade with Europe, or it will be on terms that are less favorable right. to you. Open you will not be able yeah. to shape that trading relationship. So open trade means... So I'm in favor of trade, So, but that means I'm in favor of having a strong relationship with the EU. And most of the countries within the EU don't see a contradiction between that and having trading relations with the rest of the world. It's just that the EU relationship is deeper and with fewer regulations. And when you have it with... Uh, you know, with, with, with China, it's more complicated. You know, so you know, I'm, I'm, but, not, I'm not uh, understanding uh, why, why it's a contradiction. Yeah, so open trade means not, I mean, from your perspective, I mm -hmm. guess, open trade means lower trade barriers, not just more trade. China has lots of trade with Africa, for example, but that's not an indication of open trade. Um, but Theresa May's point in her speech was, um, was to remain, for the reasons, Anne, that you and, and Gideon sort of outlined, ultimately, economically, mm -hmm. But this sovereignty issue, uh, she, she proposed a, a British Bill of Rights, and she proposed um, eliminating or, or pulling Britain out of the European Convention on Human Rights. What, what's your, Gideon, what's your reaction to that? Um, is, is that a pathway that accomplishes all the goals? That, that, is that a solution? Well, I, I think it's a, possibly a solution to her very tricky political balancing act, which is to try to <laughs> uh, you know, appeal to Tory Eurosceptics while remaining on side with David Cameron. That seems to me essentially what's going on. But, I mean, I think the question of the whole Convention of Human Rights and so on is a complicated one because I think the British, for historical reasons, have justified faith in, their, in the protection of rights in this country over a long time and uh, some belief in their own courts and their own legislature as the best protection of that. So why have we even signed up to these, these international treaties? Well, we signed up to them partly because we were trying to spread some of those ideas internationally through the European Convention on Human Rights, supported by Churchill, amongst others. And I think although we might not lose something if we left, we would damage a very important international institution, which incidentally, even Putin's Russia, I mean, Anne may correct me on this, but they they do have to pay some attention to the Strasbourg court. It is a kind of enforcer of values that, that the UK essentially aligns itself with internationally. So while we might think that, again, if we're thinking solely about the UK, that we would sort of start trashing the international legal system and we wouldn't pay a price, I think the world would pay a price. So, so, so the European Convention on Human Rights and uh, all the Lisbon Treaty process does that communicate, Steve, British, uh, a British concept of, of human rights, or is it different? Well, it does communicate a British concept of human rights, but the government's position is that we support the, the convention 
but not the jurisprudence. And again, I've referred to something that I've said before, that the European Union can't just have one human rights framework, it has to have two, and then there's enormous con confusion about it. We've got the, the European Convention on Human Rights, which is to do with um, the, the Council of Europe, not the European Union, and then we've got the Charter of Fundamental Rights and the Two Conflict. And there's a wonderful lengthy report from the European Scrutiny Committee that, that goes over these two things. It, it's a mess, and the reality is that that human rights in Europe did not collapse in the United Kingdom. We've got a long and honourable tradition of common law rights, which I'm sure all parliamentarians would wish to respect. Employment rights keep coming up. Many of the employment rights which people particularly point to were implemented in the UK without the EU, before we joined the EU. And if I may say so, while I've got the floor, it's a brilliant dressing down and you should stand for Parliament because it'd go down a storm. But I mean, the Sorry, point I'd make... Rude, no, no, it's not at all. It's fine. I'm used to much worse. <laughs> <laughs> but the point I'd make is that this is the real world. This point mm. I made earlier about Ghost moving to Singapore, because a, a company which has no premises, people working internationally, it's been the reality of my life before I got into Parliament, working in startups and freelance and not caring where the client was as long as the bill got paid. And I, I, I'm afraid mm -hmm. so the sort it's of... It's a good thing you don't manufacture things that have well, to be in a particular place. But, of know? course, manufacturing itself is changing because we're getting to the point that you, you can 3D print an enormous range of things. I, I, did a, I did a private equity turnaround on an aerospace manufacturer, and one of the things we were looking at is that instead of forging certain components, whether we could 3D print them in, men, in sintered metal. And again, this, again, some of these arguments, they're just fundamentally out of date. They're, they're fundamentally statist, and they don't reflect the way that normal people are living their lives. You know, people are connecting with one another around the world on Facebook. How about half the British public's on Facebook? Well, you, you can talk to people wherever they are within milliseconds. Well, this is categorically different. But the EU doesn't prevent you from to, doing that. Well, indeed it doesn't. And if but that's the, the case, why is the EU regulation a problem anyway? The point is that the, the, the EU is not sufficiently agile in its structures and it, to, to deal with the new world as it is. So what we need to do is look, for example, at the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which instead of trying to introduce a new Supreme Court over all of those nations, agrees that they'll use the International Labour Organization as the basic bottom line of, of labour standards. Because everybody accepts there do need to be some basic standards. They, of course, raise production costs, but you have tariff-free trade on the basis that no one will sink below the level of the ILO. That, of course, raises a new set of problems about the ILO. But the point I'm making is that this, that in a globalised world of inexpensive air travel, a pace of change which is only going to accelerate, not slow down, we need agile institutions capable of dealing with the world as it is. And that world is distributed, much more horizontally organised, and very, very different from the world for which the EU was designed. Well, let's, let's go to trade because uh, I'm conscious of time and I, I want to get a few things in. Um, uh, and let me throw something at you all. Um, Mitt Romney in the 2008, in his election campaign in 2008, proposed something. He proposed a prosperity zone, which would consist of like-minded countries, I think he called it a coalition of the willing, uh, on trade, on competition, on property rights. The countries he, he talked about were countries like the UK, like the US, Australia, New Zealand, Switzerland, you know, some other countries. Um, is it possible for, I mean, Britain in many ways, there's a spectrum between in and out. I mean, it's not really just sure. in or out. I mean, there's a spectrum. We're already in a different landing zone in a way because we're not part of the euro and we're not part of political union. Is it possible for Britain to have that kind of relationship with those kinds of countries? while at the same time retaining untrammeled access to the single market, which is obviously very important. So we'll start with Anne, and I want to ask all of you that question. Is it possible right at the second, or is it possible if Britain leaves? What, what, it, what's it, the, is, it, is, it, is it possible if, well, in all those circumstances, in, in the current moment where we have a, we're in a different landing zone, if we vote to leave, which, which triggers the Article 52-year negotiation, hmm. or if we vote to remain. Well, remember that all these countries also have their own arrangements and their own, you know, so for the U.S., for example, um, well, first of all, things are changing very rapidly in the U.S., and it's not clear to me that after this next hmm. election there will be any interest in any trade negotiations yes. at all. I mean, this may be the hmm. end of... The end of, of trade. Of, yes. of trade. <laughs> we I may mean, have bigger we, problems. We now, <laughs> have, we now have two candidates for president who've both... One has been pushed that direction, Hillary mm. Clinton, but the other one is a very active anti-trade, right. the first one we've had in, in a long time, so there may not be any, so this may be a completely moot point. Um, but even assuming, you know, say Hillary wins and there's a, some kind of agreement that we should, you know, the, you know, Britain is not a priority for the US, 
Europe is. Europe mm -hmm. is a bigger market. It's a more important market. It's many millions more people. Um, and I think Britain would find that it had this problem around the world, that you know, almost every country, when, you know, when it needs to, you know, when it thinks about what its priorities are and what it needs to do, is more interested in the EU and more mm. interested in Europe and the, and the European market than it is in Britain by itself. And I'm not saying, you know, I can imagine over a decade Britain forging different kinds of relationships, I don't know, a special relationship with Switzerland, that's, that's all possible, but the fact remains that um, the European market um, and access to the European market is going to remain is is going to be a priority, and I, you know I don't. That's just a question of numbers. I mean, when Obama came here, and and said that everybody was shocked. He's insulting us and so on. All all he was doing was saying he was you know he was pointing out the truth. You know this is a Europe is bigger. You know that's our priorities to have access to that, and and Britain will be second. And President Obama, when he came, he, he one of the things he said was that the UK would be the at the back of the queue on, on TTIP and trade agreements. I think that, uh, that, that, that's just that. true. I mean, the, yeah. you know, the, the, first of all, most of the trade agreements are, are hap you know, there, there, is a, there is a transatlantic trade agreement, which I think actually isn't going to happen anyway, no. because there are going to be any trade agreements. That probably wouldn't have happened anyway. Uh, but, next year, but, you know, there, there won't be, you know, there isn't, a, there isn't a huge demand for a trade agreement with Britain in the United States, but, you know, there yeah. also isn't a huge mm. demand for a trade agreement with Switzerland. Mm. I mean, it's a, that's just a fact of political life. Mm. So, I don't Steve, think it was an Steve, insult. so, Steve. Um, President Obama's comment about, you know, Britain is, is, is going to be at the back of the queue. Well, it seemed to help the Leave campaign magnificently. I was very grateful he's welcome to come back. But it's but almost like... Win, but, but if you win uh, in, in, this, in this referendum and, and we are leaving the yeah. European Union, there's, you know, as Anne has outlined, there's real impact on whether Britain's going to be able to get not only the kind of agreements with, around the world, but also with, with Europe. With the EU. Not having a so trade. So what would happen but if, if you? Not not having a trade deal with the United States of America is the status quo. Mm -hmm. Now Richard Tice came to the Treasury Committee on behalf of Leave.EU. He pointed out that we have more services trade with the USA than we do with the European Union, despite long-standing efforts to have a single market in services, and despite the European uh, the USA having a smaller population. So. There's, a lot of, there's an awful lot of red herrings out there. We'd all like to eliminate trade barriers, both tariff and non-tariff, but some of these arguments about must have a trade deal are, are, are red herrings. But one of the things that's implicit in what you're saying is a tension between World Trade Organization uh, uh, multi and multilateral or even bilateral deals. If you look at something like TTIP, there's, there's a couple of problems with TTIP. One is that I hear accounts that it's not likely to make it through the US Congress. And the other one is even a free trader like Peter Lilly, who's one of the few members of parliament who's actually had something to do with trade deals, he's come out against TTIP because he, having looked at the investor state dispute mechanism, is not in favour of it. it's too biased towards the investor, even for a free marketeer like himself. One of the problems with that mechanism, I think, is it has to cope with the diversity of legal systems across the European Union. English commercial law is one of our best exports, isn't it? Uh, so, yeah, yeah, we'll but whereas other places, in, other places in the European Union are far more like developing nations, and in developing nations, maybe investors have to be far more careful about the kind of institutional environment into which they invest. Um, so we're ending up negotiating a trade deal, which really means a regulatory harmonization deal, which is not likely to suit the US Congress, which doesn't suit free traders like Peter Lillian Bitch, by the way, is one of the biggest reasons why people on the left are likely to vote to leave the EU, because they know that the British Parliament can't actually carry out any detailed changes to TTIP. We'll just be invited to approve the whole thing, and approve it we certainly shall have to if we remain in. So this is a mess, and I think, again, if trade and trade deals are going to have democratic <coughs> consent, which they should have, then we need to repatriate the power to, to, to have them, and we need to deal with the problems of economic nationalism on, on the UK scale, where we've got some hope of making sure that the public consent to what we're doing. Gideon. Yeah, just, I mean, you used a very interesting phrase where you said, you said, well, of course we'd need access to the EU internal market, as if that was a given, and I tend to agree with you, but I actually don't think it's a given at all if we leave the EU, because mm -hmm. essentially, as I understand it, the Leave campaign have two very kind of strong arguments running, and one of which is immigration, free movement of people, we've got to stop that. Now, if we don't adhere to free movement of people, we're out of the single market. It's one of the essential elements of the single market. Mm -hmm. And so I think, actually, we think that the debate will be over the day after we, we voted to leave. The debate will only just be beginning, because mm -hmm. those guys haven't decided between themselves <coughs> what they actually mean by leaving. There's a group that want to mm -hmm. keep us in the internal market, and there's a group that are much more motivated <coughs> by immigration. I think if they win, they'll win on immigration. 
and therefore we will have to impose mm. uh, stop free movement of labor and therefore we will be out of the internal market we won't be and like, the EA. yeah we won't be like switzerland or norway i mm. mean because they have they're inside the internal market because they accept free movement of labor mm. um, so we would that's why you suddenly hear talk of canada albania even because um, <laughs> Because, you know, when people like Michael Gove mm -hmm. are confronted with that, they say, well, OK, we can't, you know, even Switzerland and Norway involves too much surrender of sovereignty. So they're beginning to, to look at these even more distant things. And I, I don't think you can say, well, we'll trade with the whole world. Of course, you know, these are big emerging markets and so on. But people tend to trade most with the countries that are closest to them. It's why Ireland does all, you know, it's our biggest, their biggest market is us. You know, mm. it's why Europe will always be incredibly important to us. We can't just say, oh, well, you know, we'll go off and sell stuff to Mongolia. You, you know, it's, uh, it's unrealistic to think that we can just say, well, you know, we're going to reorient ourselves and we don't care what the Europeans do with their regulation. That's not the real world. Let's, let's just talk um, about the, the geopolitical dimension. Um, <coughs> Of, of Europe and the importance of Europe. Because I think one thing that probably even the Leave campaign would agree is that Britain leaving Europe would be bad for Europe in terms of uh, its overall impact on, on, on the European area. Yes, I mean, and, and let me back that up to, mm. to talk a little bit more about geopolitics. I think one of the things that's not very well understood in Britain is the degree to which the EU um, is is also an important part of British security. You know, NATO, you know, in the, in the contemporary world, the biggest threats to British security are not only military. There are some military threats. Mm. You know, we, you know, we can do scenarios if you want. But, but the greater threats are um, economic, they're in terms of disinformation, they're, they're you know, destabilization. You know, there are other kinds of threats, and there also there are other kinds of tools that need to be used in the world. You know, having, a, having a large army, as the United States has learned um, repeatedly over the last decade or so, does not get your way everywhere. It is not the only tool that you have um, to influence other countries or, 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 or make outcomes you know, influence the way the, the world works. Um, you also need sanctions. You also need um, regulation. You know, you also need um, other kinds of foreign policy tools. And the EU is a kind of, it, you know, you have NATO as one half of British security, but the EU is an important part of the other half. And so, again, the EU is able to organize sanctions on Russia. The EU is able to, able to organize sanctions on Iran. Um, a really important and very overlooked um, achievement of the EU in the last decade has been its uh, very slow but very methodical um, uh, uh, um, uh, insurance that Europe as a whole is no longer dependent on Russian gas. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, through competition policy, through the energy policy of the EU, um, and through diplomacy, the EU has, and, and through, technical, um, through technical changes as well, the EU has reduced European dependence on gas overall, but particularly it's true of Eastern Europe, which is, of course, an important security <coughs> achievement. So the EU is a kind of, it's like you have NATO is, is the military piece of your security, and the EU is the other half of your security. And without, if Britain isn't part of it, um, first of all, I think Britain is an important influence inside the EU for, mm. for, for foreign policy thinking, or, or could be if it um, wanted to be. Um, and second of all, you know, the EU is a, is a forum within which certain kinds of, uh, certain kinds of things can be done. So, so the, the, the idea that leaving it will somehow make you stronger um, is, makes no sense to me. Mm. To um, and, 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 your, and your second point mm. about the EU itself, you know, yes, the EU is, there are a number of reasons right now why the EU, uh, the, why they're, you know, the, the, the European um, geopolitics are precarious. And one of them is that Russian influence and the attempt to use Russian power inside Europe is the strongest and most active and most aggressive it's been in 25 years. So the Russia funds mm -hmm. far right and far left parties in Europe. Russia has a very clear um, disinformation policy in Europe to influence debate, political debate, which you didn't feel so much here because of Britain's big mm -hmm. media market and because mm -hmm. of the BBC. Um, but the you know, but the, the the forces pushing Europe apart are coming. Um, you know, are not. You know, are ones that Britain should also be fighting against, and you you, you will need to be within the EU in order to stop them. For so security, Steve, is 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 NATO uh, an argument that is often made on your side is that that actually it's not about the EU, it's about NATO. NATO has been the guarantee of European peace 
for all these years, and and we will still have a relationship with with NATO. S assuming um, there's no President Trump. Well, okay. yes, then, then no one will have a relationship <laughs> well, with NATO. Yeah. But um, but what's your view of security? What, what's the European role in security? What would we what would we be losing? Well, again, it's one of these things where the European Union seems to want to duplicate things. One of my friends who in Parliament who rep who represents us at NATO went off for a briefing on um, the piracy operation off Somalia and ended up refusing an EU briefing because it was a duplicate of the briefing he'd just had from the NATO commander. There were two com competing com command structures. Well, apart from the duplication and waste, what would that actually mean during operations to have this conflict over which limited military resources were under whose command? The but point wait, I, the EU did defeat Somali pirates. That, that was well, actually an EU operation. Well, the point I'm making is that that operation successful as it has been, has ended up under two command structures. But the, the point I want to make is this. But it was, it was an EU-led operation, yeah? Yes, I believe it was an EU-led operation, but right. one of the other points one might, might make Yeah, because is it wasn't an appropriate, it was exactly the kind of operation that NATO can't do. You know, NATO doesn't do that kind, you know, requires well, a different level of, uh, of decision-making. There's no reason for us to accept a Supreme Court over our own in order to cooperate militarily overseas. It just simply isn't necessary, and I don't see any justification for it. But the point I'm trying to make is this. If we're going to stand off against a massive military power like Russia or, God help us, China, that implies massive military force. And that implies the United States of America, and that means NATO. Now, a contrary point is this, is that when you look through the numbers, which I don't have before me, but when you look through the numbers about the amount of bang for your buck you get in Europe, by not having a common set of defence forces to match the common foreign policy, the efficiency isn't there to provide the massive military force which the United States can provide. It's something one of my colleagues is going to be speaking about in the forthcoming weeks, so I don't feel too bad for not stealing his thunder with all the detail. But we really, since we don't believe in the project, we really ought to get out of the way of the European Union providing common defence forces, which makes sense if you share land borders, perhaps, in a way which it doesn't if you're an island nation, which doesn't need a, a large standing army, but which does need a good air force and a strong navy. So we, we've, because of our physical location, the geopolitics of being the United Kingdom are profoundly different and always have been. There are about eight pinch points around the world for trade. That means we should have a navy, navy capable of, of keeping those routes open. We should be able to project air power. We're going to be able to after a short hiatus without any airplanes to put on the carriers. But nevertheless, once we get through that, we will have aircraft on carriers again. But I think anybody who believes that we're going to be able to um, cut loose from the United States in order to project the power necessary to defer and deter Russia. That's a strong Russia. man. Nobody is suggesting that. Well, but well, is, is, it, is it duplicative, though? I'm going to ask one question to Gideon, and then we're going to go to the audience for, well, you, for some questions. But, but, but duplicative, um, is it duplicative? I mean, the, the ideas of a European, single European you know, force, army, whatever... Um, well, I think actually, I mean, I'll answer that briefly, but I'd also like to make mm, a broader point about yeah. strategic... I mean, I think there's been an interesting evolution in the American attitude to European Union defence, because I remember at the time of the Iraq war, the, uh, the countries that were opposed to it, Luxembourg, uh, France, Germany, they had this thing, the Somme des Pralines, where they proposed a European army, and the Americans mm. were very angry about it and saw it as a challenge to NATO. But actually, in recent years, the Americans have been much more supportive of the idea of EU defence because they think it's one way that the EU might actually get its act together, be more organised, uh, standardise equipment, etc. So I don't. So I think the days when the Americans were opposed to that and saw it as a competition to NATO are over. But just if I finally, because I've been contradicting Steve all evening, I'd like to say something he probably agrees with, which is I think that the European Union is in big trouble. Mm. Uh, but oddly, and this is not an argument that I would deploy to persuade people to remain, because it sounds too paradoxical, but it's because it's in big trouble that I think we should stay in it. If this is a burning house we should remain in. Uh, and the reason I, I come to that argument is that when, when, I, when I was in Brussels, uh, when things were going OK 10 years ago, I didn't really take the peace in Europe argument that seriously. It did seem to me it was largely a political, economic thing. But, we, but things are getting quite dark in Europe, and the, there are political forces that are rising up that are uniformly opposed to the EU, Marine Le Pen, people like Viktor Orban, people the, the new government in Poland. And that has made me realise that actually for all its flaws, the EU is signed up to a common set of values that I think all of us actually would subscribe to, liberal democratic values. There is a form of peer pressure through the EU. If we left the EU, it would be a massive kick in the teeth to this organisation that, frustrating as it is, actually is a forum for international cooperation which is signed up to, to values that we support. And there would be people in the wings who we really wouldn't like and who would be massively empowered by the kind of blow that Britain would deal to the European Union. So, Steve, you will get a